John Wick is on the run after killing a member of the International Assassin's Guild. And with a $14 million price tag on his head, he is the target of hitmen and women everywhere. John Wick 3 is up next on Inside Movies. Hey guys, uh, welcome to another episode of Inside Movies. Uh, this week, uh, we're continuing on with their Keanu Reeves month, uh, reviewing John Wick 3. Uh, I'm joined by the editor-in-chief of Merck Publishing, Murphy, novelist, Andrew Buckley, and writer-illustrator, GMV Kamicha. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, what's the good? What do we like about John Wick 3? More bullets. More blood, more dogs, more hotels, more ambiguous titles for people from the international community of mysterious murderers. It has more of everything. It's the third one. John Wick 3, there's been two before it. Isn't it weird that it's John Wick, John Wick 2, uh, John Wick 4 is just John Wick 4, but John Wick 3 is John Wick Parabellum. <laughs> like, they gave it a subtitle, but... Yeah, and John Wick 4 is like chapter 4. Yeah, oh, it's a chapter 4? Okay. Yeah, so they're all chapters. Well, they should probably... Now, and what's a Parabellum? Uh, it's, it's like when you have two bellums together on the shelf? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the line that Ian McShane says, like, if you want peace, prepare for war, or something like that. Looking it up, Parabell. Oh, Latinum. Yeah, okay. okay it, was, yeah, yeah. it was in the damn movie, Craig. Second half. I forgot because there was so much gunplay. I was just in that. If you've seen the previous <laughs> Greg was dialogue. crazed by a bullet. So, yes, this movie is dope and it has so much incredible action in it. It's possibly the best collection of action scenes ever assembled for a film, in my opinion. Uh, from the hand to hand fight with the book against uh, NBA player uh, Boban. Uh, I don't know how to say his name, Marjanovic, <laughs> Boban. And uh, the scene in the antique store with the knives where he's like throwing the knives at the guys, like one goes in the guy's head and then they're on the horses and the motorcycles. And then there's Halle Berry and the dogs in like Morocco. And uh, and then like forgotten 90s action movie star, uh, Mark Dacascus. Yeah, and like the two guys from the raid, like that action scene, it is it is just insane it's like balls to the wall action it's it's ridiculous i always really like when a movie picks up like exactly where the last one left off especially when you're watching them in tandem i just i always find that to be enjoyable um and it also i'm also the kind of move the, the kind of person that before i go see a sequel a sequel i want to watch the last one first but like it really feels like you're stepping you're stepping from one chapter right into the next chapter and the story is just continued i just from a, from a storytelling perspective i always appreciate that the one thing that I would not give this movie, this series of movies credit for is like strong storytelling. There's great plot, but there's not a lot of strong storytelling with the exception of this third installment. I really did love the idea that he begs for life essentially because then he'll be the repository of the memory of the person that he loved. As a storytelling trope, that was like beautiful. I was, it caught me, it hit me like a poem in the middle of a gunfight. It was, that part was great. In the end, it does tie him back to, you know, the initial premise of the first movie as well, which they kind of ignored in the second one. So it, it did work out nice. But man, the action sequence in this, the dude, like Chad Stilen, Stil, Stilensky? Stilensky. Stilensky. You know, we have to do a super cut of inside movies where none where of we us can't pronounce anyone's names. name ever. <laughs> we don't. Um, he doesn't repeat action sequences. He always, they always try to do something that's different which is pretty impressive when you consider this is the third movie and they're about to go into the fourth. Uh, but even that opening sequence, which is about, I think clocks in about 15 minutes or so, where um, he goes from the library to the museum to uh, weaponizing a horse. Like, it's just, it, man, it's just super fun. It's, it's hard not to love these things. Yeah, no, it's just, it's so great. And it does kind of continue to expand the mythology. You actually go and meet the guy at the high table and he's got to cut his finger off. And, and he's got the cross, which is like his ticket or something that he's got to get punched. I don't know. There's just a there's golden a bunch... object. <laughs> so there See is. Previous video criticism. 
there is more to it. I really liked uh, Halle Berry's character and how she had uh, helped him uh, previously and he had a marker for her. So I guess he had helped her. I don't know. So he needed her help and she comes and those dogs are dope and I, I liked it a lot. The training she had to go through with those dogs was crazy. It was like six months of imprinting on them so that they would actually listen to her because <clears throat> they didn't want an external trainer ordering them around on camera. They wanted her to actually give the commands and for them to follow. So she did like, and then she broke like three ribs <laughs> during the movie too. Oh God. Like, totally badass. But wait, what happens to those dogs now that they won't listen to anyone else? They still listen to the initial sure. trainer. I would like to see a spin-off with, with her character. I, oh, I'd, yeah. be, I'd be down for that, 100%. What was her character's name? If you can name her character, then you can have a spin-off. I don't know. It's been... Really hey, you don't deserve it. I mean, just speaking of Halle Berry in general, if you know, I feel like I haven't seen her in, in anything new recently, and so that was kind of a pleasure to see her in like a super action-packed role. I think she did a great job. Uh, with we also got to talk about like the different actors that keep introducing into the series. Uh, like you mentioned, the two guys who are in it from the raid. I do not know their name, but they were they supposed to be the Indonesian fighters, like in, in, during yeah. the whole glass office thing. Like that whole sequence in itself, like the respect that they show because it's John Wick. They kind of have him up on this pedestal, and he lets them live. Out of anybody he fights in this movie, he lets those two guys live because they have this nice back and forth where they're just trying to see if they can beat the guy. And when they don't, he's like, "See you around," and just leaves it at that. But Angelica Houston being in this movie, uh, we didn't mention it during John Wick 2, but Lawrence Fishburne reuniting with him, you know, from yeah, Lawrence the Matrix Fishburne, trilogy. The Bowery King. The Bowery King. So good. And they introduce um, Mark uh, De DeCascos in this one. He was in Brotherhood of the Wolf, and I forget what the other one was. But his was the uh, Zero, like the leader of the whole ninjas. Like his, his role is awesome in this too. And I forget who played the adjudicator. I had her name written down, but I don't seem to have it in my notes. But she, like, she was just a great, she played a great role. I also like the the guy that was on Game of Thrones, and he was in Morocco there. And, Jerome Flynn. Uh, yeah, he was like in a English boy band or something like that, right? Yep. And yeah, and then he shows up in John Wick, and and he's awesome. And that guy is one of my favorite actors. Like I I, every scene he's Wick in, five. he always steals it. He's yeah, English boy band. Robson and Jerome. I, I grew up watching them because it was right around the era when I was growing up in England. If you're looking for another great property that has some amazing fan patels in it, much like the Adjudicator in John Wick 3, then you want to check out something wonderful coming from George. Yes! Uh, Cover of Darkness Fem Patels is available to pre-order into your local comic book store right now. Uh, it features four short stories with art from uh, Nat Jones, who worked on Spawn and Death Dealer. Uh, my resilient collaborator, uh, Vinzel Tabanis, and then two newcomers, uh, Colin Turnbull and Ty Peterson. This is their first published comic book work, and I'm sure they're going to go on to like some incredible uh, projects in the future. So get this uh, this anthology. It's like five dollars, and it's it's dope. It's got four cool stories in it. Uh, so ask your local comic book store to bring it in. Uh, link in the description of this video. Uh, let's get into the bad. What do we not like about John Wick Three? $14 million to a bunch of super assassins who clearly don't give a shit about money at all and pay for everything in gold. Gold is uh, currently uh, $1,800 Canadian an ounce, and they're just throwing gold coins around like crazy. It's like, if they need that $14 million, it's maybe stop paying for everything in gold coins. Maybe. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. And maybe the like idea is that money is no object because they use money to make their golden objects so that they can live in this world above people. But I don't think they thought it through that much. You're so cranky about all the shiny objects in these movies. I just, Greg. I'm like a reverse crow. Is it because I don't they like shiny objects? I it. Is it because they kill so many Russians in the first two movies? It is. It is. That makes sense. I like that. Uh, at least in this movie, they've gone to other countries to kill people. That's fair. Yeah, they stopped killing Russians and just kind of had a free-for-all for everybody, which is great. Uh, the fall at the end of this movie, when he falls off the building, as much as I love these movies, even when I saw that in the theater, I was like, so he's still alive? That's that's impressive. And he didn't get knocked unconscious. Why not? Well, uh, he did. He didn't land on that one spot at the back of his head <laughs> where the flashlight would hit him. And he's he got like an off switch. Yeah, his, uh, <laughs> he's like Data with an off switch at the back of his head. The bullet, the bulletproof suit actually has uh, interior airbags. I don't know if you missed that part. Um, oh, I didn't know made that. Made for falling off of buildings. Yeah. That makes sense. 
But yeah. Is... No, that was pretty ridiculous. It's so stupid. I don't think he got knocked out, though, because Jason Manzukas comes and picks him up in a wheelbarrow and takes him to the Bowery King, right? And just, like, unceremoniously, like, just dumps him out of it, too. It was great. Uh, you know what? I, I take it back. I still love it. I have nothing bad to say about this one. Sorry. I, yeah, so, like, my, like, bad list is, like, almost non-existent. It is the fall, which I knew what they were going for with, like, the Buster Keaton falling off a building uh, thing, but it's just, he takes too many hits, and he, he, you know, he's falling into, like, fire escapes, and you're like, oh, that's some ribs there. Oh, that's, you know, you're dead. And it does just too much. And I guess another criticism is uh, Lawrence Fishburne's character. I don't really get what his motivation is he kind of lives in that world of the hitman but he's kind of on the outskirts of it and i i don't really understand where they're going with that storyline at all i really hope it comes together with john wick 4 because i don't know what's going on yeah he feels like the merovingian in the matrix movies just like a cool name i'm the bowery king and that's as far as they got and we, i'm a good actor so put me in scenes but there's no connective tissue as to why they are together except that you know off screen they're friends the barry king is meant to rule the streets whereas you know the continental is like a safe haven and the high table rules everything like the barry king is meant to own like the streets which is why it's like a bunch of homeless people that work for him or whatever but it's never truly clear as to what the actual motivation behind what he does is or anything you're right and how far are they taking it with this like army uh, army of homeless people like they're collecting the trash are they like doing the drugs are they soiling themselves like how what is going on there i don't know I'm like why are you signing up for this gig why couldn't they just be like at a you know having coffee why do they have to be sitting i don't i don't understand i wanted there's so much i want to say about the unhoused army of the bowery king but i'm just gonna leave it you've you've summed it up i think well enough George. <laughs> Maybe we're looking too deep. Maybe the problem is us. Maybe we're looking too deep in a movie that's just supposed to be an action fantasy. Well, so that's, you know, the reason that I have seen number three and without without watching number two before then was because I believe my exact answer was like, what? It's John Wick. Like, <laughs> It's you can't you can't take it that seriously. Like I, I enjoy these movies because you know it's it's a really well done action movie. You walk in for that, and then just lower your standards, I guess. <laughs> yeah, like story wise, it is kind of almost similar to like a James Bond franchise where it's like it doesn't you don't necessarily have to have watched the previous one. It's gonna have some incredible action set pieces and you know you're going to learn a little bit more about this world in every iteration but it, it doesn't really matter i don't think but like i, I said at the is... top this has got like the, the best collection of action scenes in a movie ever maybe i think that is a, a the perfect metaphor is that this is literally just american james bond and i mean who knows if they'll just like create you know keep recasting it forever i don't know that i don't know that they would be able to market that well because keanu reeves is john wick but that that comparison is perfect let's get into the skinny let's let's give our final grades for uh john wick uh, chapter three uh i would give john wick chapter three um four out of five misplaced library books um misplaced in the face of an assassin obviously um for action cinematography uh i loses one misplaced library book, book in the face of an assassin for just not really having enough connective tissue in the story it promises me a lot and every time they reveal something it's just another golden object uh i'm gonna go a plus with this one uh the the action in it is just balls to the wall it's it's yeah it's face meltingly awesome it's just it's so good and you know yeah the story is simple and i felt the the finale with the shootout uh, at the continental was getting to be a bit repetitive with just them like shooting 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 but they really varied the action and so it's like different kinds uh you know he's hand to hand with dogs on a horse with knives like with guns like lots of cool so they really mix it up a lot and if you're an action movie 
you know, junkie like I am, like you're, this is among the best ever made. It's like a Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> I will not kill you, John Wick <laughs> 3, on a train with a monkey. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like that's all that's left now. Trains and monkeys. Trains and monkeys. I, I love this one. This is my favorite out of the three thus far. Uh, I give it uh, six Jerome Flynn's getting his balls mauled by a dog out of five. Because he deserved it. Because he shot that dog. I should have given it para a parabellums so that yeah. you'd have it. Uh, I'm going to give it one out of one marker medallion. It's a perfect John Wick movie. Very good, and I'm excited for the next one. Yes. And... Uh, come back uh, next week. We're reviewing John Wick Chapter Four, uh, so you don't you're not going to want to miss that. Um, Cover of Darkness Femme Fatales is available to pre-order into your local comic book store. So ask them to bring it in, and there is a link in the description of this, of this video. Until next time, peace. <laughs>